and objectives of NDPR, benefits and sanctions of NDPR, our own NDPR compliance project methodology as a DPCO, that is as a data protection compliance organization for NIDA. And then I give you my conclusion, then we have the question and answer. Now, I'm trying to give you a scenario here, and I want everybody to read this. Please read this. When you read it, let me have your answer by chat, through chat. So accountability in ABC, which team is accountable for NDPR compliance? This is just a poll from people outside that they want to know in case of there is a team on ground and they want to know exactly who is supposed to be accountable for Nigeria Data Protection Regulation or European Union General Data Protection Regulation. Quickly, I want you to know that EUDPR, which is European Union General Data Protection Regulation, is also binding on us in Nigeria as long as you process or handle any data belonging to an EU resident or an EU citizen. So it is not only NDPR you should prepare for, you should also prepare for EU DPR. And there is no way any NACIMA member or NACIMA will not have a, an EU resident data with you. So you have to comply as well. Now, I hope everybody has read what I put on the screen. I want you to know and give me an answer or write your answer down. By the time we finish, you may tell me your answer. The second one I want to give you is this. This is another poll. It's, it borders to, on accountability as well. In the case of NDPR breach, who will be blamed? Let's assume that there's an NDPR breach today. Who will be blamed in your organization? Is it, is it the board of directors of your organization? Is it the information technology? Is it the legal department? Is it the risk and compliance department? who is going to be blamed, the audit is there, or a combination of the above. I want you to write the answer down, or either send it to me by chat. Mr. Okwe can look at the chat. So, I want you to know that there is no perfect, there is no perfect data privacy at all, it is not absolute. It is a living document and it will need to be worked upon. And it is subject to reasonable restrictions, both to the data subject, the data controller, and data processor. There are restrictions on regulations anywhere. So also with NDPR. And the restriction is affecting either the data subject. Who is a data subject? Let me quickly tell you the data subject. Everybody in this webinar today is a data subject. In NDPR or EUDPR, the terminology used for an individual is data subject. So whoever is an individual and you have data that somebody will collect from you, under NDPR or EUDPR, you are being regarded as a data subject. Then who is a data controller? Nasima is a data controller because you collect data from people, from your employees, for your contractors, for your members, because, and when you collect this data, you give out instructions on how those data will be used. So the difference between you and data processor is that a data controller will give out instructions why a data processor must follow the instruction of a data controller to be able to process whatever contract they have together. So a data processor is somebody who processes data on behalf of a data controller. For example, Nasira may decide to say, okay, we need a software company to do a payroll system for us. And you have data which you are giving them. So that software company or another firm or, or, or anybody that will process any data on your behalf, that is a data processor. Because by the value that you are giving that data processors, that particular contract, there are things that will go along, and those things are the data of the data subjects. That is data of the individuals 
like I've told you, I will be using mostly data subject for individual. So the data of the data subject will go along, and by virtue that you are having as a data processor, you have all those data, you are by you are you are supposed to make sure you protect those data that it will not get to wrong hand. So that is the difference between a data controller, a data subject, and a data processor. Mr. Pelaron, I hope you are recording this. Please record this. So if you have not started recording, you can start recording now. Now. It's very it's very okay. Okay. So my next slide. Introduction. Before the advent of Nigeria Data Protection Regulation by NIDA, Mr. Pelano was in our, about, the, we are now in 2020, 2020. I think around 2016, we were at our program. As at that time, there was nothing like Nigeria Data Protection Regulation. And at that time, we were using an NGO, Data and Knowledge Information Privacy Protection Initiative, to promote data protection and data privacy. So as at that time, there was nothing like a common law. We have so many laws in Nigeria that affects data protection and data privacy. But because of neither coming on ground, all those laws, they cannot be recognized anymore. But there is a section on our, in our constitution, section 37 of the constitution provide that the privacy of citizens their homes, correspondence, telephone, conversation, and telegraphic communication, the cyber guaranteed and protected. I want to ask you a question. Is that section really working in Nigeria? That is left for you to know. So the data protection law in Nigeria exists in different status and regulation before NDPR came into force. You will know when it comes into force by the time we move on. Now, why is NIDA actually on ground to regulate data privacy and data protection? Why? The reason is being that there's a section that gives them that power. Section 6C of NIDA Act provides the agency shall develop guidelines for electronic governance and monitor the use of electronic data interchange and other forms of electronic communication transaction as an alternative to paper-based method. So, NIDA data protection guidelines, that is how they are now acting on that power because there are other agencies or ministries that wanted to regulate this data protection and data privacy. I can give you an example because I have the privacy guidelines with me. Minister of Justice has tried. Minister of Justice tried it. Also, the Senate also, but at the end of the day, Neither is the one doing it now. But Senate is now supporting NIDA to make sure it works. Because without this regulation, we may, we, we may have problem with international business. Because every organization or, or every country in the world wants to, every country to have a regulation protecting their privacy. And that is why this regulation is so important to Nigeria. What are the Nigerian laws that were on ground before NDPR? We have Section 34 of Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999. The privacy of citizens, their homes, correspondence, telephone conversation, which I've told you. Consumer Code of Practice. 20, 2007, all licenses must take reasonable steps to protect consumer information against improper or accidental declosure and ensure such information is stored securely. We have also Child Rights Act 2003, which guarantees the right of every child less than 80 years to privacy and limits access to certain information. We also have Section 12 and 14 of Freedom of Information Act 2011, which limits access to personal information public institution cannot disclose private information without specified safeguard. President Jonathan Goodluck signed Freedom of Information into law 2015 before he left. But unfortunately, I can tell you it's not really working in Nigeria now. Because by the actual freedom of information, it means if you go to any ministry or MDA, 
and ask for information they are supposed to give you, but it is not working. Even if you don't go, they are supposed to publish some information on their website so that we can know exactly, like example, you construct a bridge, we are supposed to know how much you have used, how much you have spent, what is the output, what is the outcome. There's a difference between an outcome and an output. You can have an output, but you may not have the outcome. Output means that you want to build 50 houses. You can see 50 houses on ground. But the outcome is that what are the things that that project has done? The outcome, you build a house for the poor and you are selling for 50 million, the outcome is zero. Or you want to do something and you cannot justify the reason that means it is not an outcome. So these are the things freedom information is supposed to address so that you can now monitor all the MDs, but because it's not working, nobody can monitor them. Then we have the CBN Consumer Protection Framework 2016, which restrains financial institutions from disclosing personal information to consumer. That is guiding the financial institution. You can't just go there. And that is why when you go to banks, the cashier, the customer relation service, will not divulge any information except you fulfill some requisite things on ground. They will ask you certain questions. The moment you cannot answer those questions, they will not attend to you based on, on anybody. Even if it's your own personal information, you must be able to identify and prove that it is your information that you want to get. Contents of EDPRA, when you're talking about Nigeria Data Protection Regulation, it's just a set of rules about how organizations should process the personal data of individuals. There are laid down guidance, there are laid down principles that you must follow for you to process the personal data of any data subject. And if you don't follow those principles and those rights, you will be breaching the NDPR, and that may attract fine. So NDPR also state rules of organization in ensuring that Privacy and protection of personal data provides individuals with certain rights and gives power to the regulatory agency to monitor organizations in the implementation. The NIDA is monitoring every organization now. And with time, you will start hearing people being fined for wrongful use or application of personal data. It applies to all transactions either an intending transaction or an actual transaction. Let me explain that to you. The moment I sent a proposal to Nasima that let us have a webinar, it was an intention, but you have some, some data pertaining to me. Nasima must, by NDPRA, keep my data, whether we are having it today or not, you have, you must keep my data. If I should find out that my data has been compromised, even though I have not done actual business with you, by intention, it means I can report you to NIDA for breach. Not only will NIDA find you, I personally can find you. I personally can take you that what you have done is causing me mental torture. That by virtue of what you have done, releasing my data to where it's not supposed to be is causing me mental torture. And under this, we have we know it as non-material damage. I don't need to prove that you have damaged any material or property or anything, but it is called non-material damage. You can see the, the damage physically, but I can prove to you that it's affecting me mentally. So it is not only neither that you pay fine to, you will also pay fine to data suggests where you breach. So you need to be extremely careful. And that is why everybody needs to make sure they comply now. Like instead of directors, I was their guest speaker in February, and now they have signed us up. We are their data protection compliance organization. We are going to do make sure they have a compliance on ground. Now, who are these data subjects? The question you ask yourself is who? Where, why, when, and what? You can see my screen. So you ask yourself, who are the data subjects? Who has access to their personal data? When you have answer to this, it will guide you a lot. Then where? Where the personal data is stored? You must know where the personal data is stored. 
and you must know where the personnel is going to be transferred to, either locally or internationally. And then, apart from that, do they have requisite protective measures on ground? These are questions you need to have because if you transfer personal data of an individual or a data subject to somewhere and it's not protected, that data controller will be prosecuted. Why? Why the personal data is under the company control? Why do you have to get those personal data? You have to say, why? Do we really need it? You want to, an employer, an employee wants to apply and wants to be an em employee of your organization. And he wants to, he, he send you an application. You have to collect minimum information from that employee so that you don't collect excessive information. So you now ask yourself, what kind of data should I collect? Why personal data is under the company? Why do I want to collect it? Is it for a purpose? Is it a contract between us? You have a vendor, you have a consultant. Why, why? These are questions you have. Then when? When the personal data is kept until it's shared with the third party, when will it be kept until? That is retention period. And who is it going to be shared with? Then the last one, what? What safety mechanism and controls are in place? Do you have policy on ground to safeguard those personal data? Do you have hardware like firewall, like all that things? Even manual one, do you have filing cabinets on ground? Even though you have filing cabinets on ground, do you have locks that will lock the filing cabinet? Even when you have locked the filing cabinet with padlocks, do you put the padlocks there? I mean, you put the key where the padlocks are and anybody can see it and then can open the filing cabinet. These are questions you ask yourself. Because it's one thing to say you are protecting and you now lock the cabinet, you, you did not put a padlock or you put a padlock you lock it, you put the key on top of the filing cabinet, anybody can see opening. So you have not really protected it. Then what are personal, when you talk about personal data, what is a personal data? Because I've been talking about personal data, personal data, within yourself you'll be asking, what is this man saying? What is personal data in the real sense of it? So I'm going to let you know what a personal data is. If you look at my screen, Personal data is any information that relates to an identified or identifiable living individual. I want to punch on living individual. Personal data of a dead fellow is not applicable under NDPR. You must be a living individual. So any information that can identify you or can be used to, be, to identify you, that is a personal data. For example, Okwe Alano is a personal data because that is his name. By virtue of his name, he can be recognized, he can be identified. His date of birth can also identify him. His IP address can be identified him when he's on, on the internet. There are so many things you can use to, use to identify him. His staff number, personal number at Nasima can be used to identify him. Then the BBN, the national identity number, his email address can also be used to identify him. And location, when you, are on, when, when you are on Google or you are on your mobile phone, you can tell you the location where you are talking from. So that is also a, a password. Then we have the medical data. This medical data will be explained more because it falls under sensitive personal data. We have what we call sensitive personal data and this ones you don't play with them. That will even attract more fine than just ordinary personal data. Now let me go to my next slide and you see what I mean by sensitive personal data. You can see my screen now, health, anything that relates to health is a sensitive data. Anything that relates to biometric is a sensitive data. Anything that is genetic, genetic in nation, is a sensitive data because by your genetic, you can be identified. Then when you belong to a trade union, because it's a sensitive issue, trade union can create a lot of problems. So whatever data you have under trade union is sensitive. Russia, you know that in Nigeria, Russia is creating a lot of problems. So also political, it's a, it's a sensitive data. So. If this law is really enforced, by 2023, when we are going to have election, there are a lot of things that will not fly like that of 2019. 
also religion. Religion is so sensitive that you know the abort religion has caused in this country, and also sex life. If you have my sex life, you can't discuss. You can't discuss it with anybody. It's so sensitive. So all these are regarded as special category, and they can generally not be processed except given explicit consent and necessary for employment and other well-defined circumstances. So you can see the difference between a sensitive data and a personal data. Now let's go to who exactly does this Nigeria Data Protection Regulation apply to? The question is more that your organization, Nasima, who is a data controller, should ask herself, does my company process personal data of Nigerian residents? That is the first question you ask yourself. If it is yes, then the regulation is applicable to you. Does my company process the personal data of Nigerians residing abroad? If it is yes, then it is applicable to you. Does my company have employees in Nigeria? That is, if I am a foreigner and I have a company here and I possess the, com I possess the data of Nigerians, it is applicable to me. Or if I am a Nigerian company and I possess also employees in Nigeria, it is applicable to me. So a resident in Nigeria who works here, this is applicable to him as well. Just like EU GPR, as a resident in Europe, EU GPR is binding on you. So if you have a company in London now and you have Nigerians there, this is binding on that company in London. So if they don't process their data very well, the people working in that company in London can say, look, you have breached NDPR. So NDPR is global. So because you, if you are in London, don't think you cannot be penalized. You will be penalized because it's a global regulation. Now let's look at the areas of NDPR. Organizational means in an organization, it is applicable. In the technical area also, it is, a tech, it is of technical nature, whereby you must have technical things to protect. Organization, you use mostly policies, rules, regulation. And when you talk about legal, the legal aspect of it. So those are the things you look at when you are talking about data protection. Yes, what is processing? Because I've been talking about personal data. You want to know why I can breach. So if I hold your data now, what have I done with those data? Before you can ask, tell me that I have breached or I have not been using your data very well or I have, you know, illegally I have collected the data. What do I do on those personal data? The moment you collect data, the moment I send a proposal to Nasima, already they have created, they have started creating personal data. And because Nasima will use that data, it's part of processing. When they share my data, it's also part of processing. And when you now saw it into, in a manner form, either in the file cabinet, paper, hard copy, or electronically on your system or on your mobile devices or any other devices, it is also being processed. And when you now finish, when you now finish using my data, what do you do with it? How do you dispose of my data? Either manually or electronically, you are also processing. So it involves creating, using, sharing, storing, and disposal. Those are, those we mean, that is what we mean by processing. We now get to a very important area, the principles of NDPR. Nigeria Data Protection Law has six principles. The first principle is that it more, whatever, whenever you are collecting personal data of anybody, it must be lawful and it must be legitimate. And there's a provision in the articles that back it up. Article 2.1 says that the personal data collected and processed must be legitimate and for a lawful purpose. What do I mean by legitimate? Legitimacy means by the fact that you are doing a business. And that business you are doing, because it requires some certain things while you are doing it, it means you are doing a legitimate business. But lawful means it must be legal. So an example is a doctor who 
has inf information of data about a patient that is sick, and that patient cannot talk at that particular time anymore. By virtue of his duty, his profession, legitimately, he can use the personal data of that fellow to do certain things. Because under, it is already under command. And his profession allows him to do some things that is legitimate. Specific purpose means whatever you want to collect, it must be for a specific purpose. For example, I want to come to work with Nasima now. And I have sent you an application. Whatever that will be in my application will be purely and specific for employment purpose, not for any other thing. So, as a contractor, whatever I send to you must be purely for that contract you want to do with me. If you want to do another contract, you have to get another information regarding that contract. It must be specific. If you don't do it specifically, then you are in problem. Let me give you a scenario at this time. Listen very carefully what I want to say. I come to Naisima and I tell you that, look, I want you to do something for me. And I give you that consent to do it. And go ahead and do that thing. That was the first one. Okay, for example, I say, buy this buy this product on my behalf and i will pay for it by my card i have given you a consent you have done it that is for a specific purpose that you buy a car i will pay now after i have given you that consent and because you have an info you have access to my details you now go ahead without calling me again you know, to do another business on my behalf, which I have not asked you to do specifically, you are breach. Or I have given you a consent to do something on my behalf. Go and buy me a form that I can, can use to register with Nasima. And along the line, on my way to leaving your office, on my way, I just decided to look, I don't even like, I need the form again. And I made a call to you and say, please stop, don't buy that for me again. And you went ahead. You are already wrong. Because I have changed my mind. I gave you the consent and I decided not to give you the consent again. So immediately I call you and say, look, stop. Don't do that thing again. And you go ahead. You are breach. Because I gave you my consent and I said no. And I said, go and buy a form for me, you have no right to buy a form. And because I have, given you a, 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 I have not given you a blanket order, I have only given you a specific order to do certain things for me. So under NDPR, you must be specific for something. Accuracy. For anything you want to do, the data must be accurate. If the data is not accurate, you can stop it. You can't use any inaccurate data to do anything. Then the storage and security. Anything you want to do under Article 2.1, personal data shall be stored for the period, only for the period they are reasonably required to do so. That is, means that if you have a policy on ground and say six years we store this, after six years, you have no right to keep that data again. But there is, a, there is something I want you to know. We have statutory storage system, statutory policy as well. The statutory policy overrides organizational policy, because that is government policy. So you can have, we must make sure you know the statutory requirement for storing certain documents. And then when you store, you must secure those data, whether you like it or not. If you don't secure those data, and you allow that data to be, author, to be assessed by an authorized person, you are under, or you have already breached because the owner can tell you, I mean, the data so you can say, look, yes, I gave you my personal data, but you have allowed an authorized person to access my data and I'll use my data, which is now affecting me. Then confidentiality, integrity, and availability. 
This is what we call CIA under information security. It's called a triad responsibility. Confidentiality means that whatever you collect must be confidential. You don't have to make it, you must make sure it is kept. The integrity, you don't have to change the information or the data. For example, if my date of birth is 20 March 2020, you have no right to change it from 20 March 2020 to 2020 February. It means it has no integrity again. Or you want to, somebody has given you an information that you have 50 boys, 50, 10 girls for a report, and you now change it to 10 girls, 50 boys. It has no integrity again. So integrity is very key. Then availability means whatever you collect must be available at any given time. If I come as a, as a data soldier and say, look, I want to see certain things, you must be able to provide it for me. It must be available at any given time when I, have, when I make a request for it. Then we have the compliance and enforcement. The last six, the last one, which is compliance and enforcement, this is where a Nigerian, Nigerian factor is put in place. Neither the regulator knows that they don't have the manpower yet. And even they have the manpower, it's of no use employing people to start doing compliance for the whole nation. It will be too expensive. So what they do is to organize and license some agents. And those agents now work for NIDA. They had their criteria when they were being asked to come in. And if you go through the criteria and you are successful, you become a licensed agent. And NIDA continues to monitor the activities, the performance, the roles and responsibilities of this data protection compliance organization which we call DPCO, because it is the responsibility of NIDA. They are the agents of NIDA. So if they do anything wrong, it's going to affect the integrity of NIDA. So these agents have no right to enforce anything. They can only make recommendations when they work with data controllers. As I've told you, data controller is, means an organization. So DPCO, they cannot enforce. NIDA has the finances to enforce, and they follow NIDA instruction. I can always liken it to the question of data controller and data processor. You can see DPCO as a data processor, and you can see NIDA as a data controller. Just like your organization is a data controller, and your consultants, your vendors, if you ask them to do special things for you, they are your data processor. But the beauty of this DPCO is that if they have not been involved, there is no way NIDA can justify this regulation when it comes to competence. They can't do it because they haven't got the manpower. And not only the manpower, they have to think ahead because it's going to be a living document. There must be amendment with time to bring in new things within the industry, within the country, and also internationally. So that is that. We go to the next slide, which has the data subjects right. We have eight data subjects rights. And these are very, very important. These rights, they are rights to protect every data subject. That's it, they are rights to protect you, they are rights to protect me. And they are rights to put into control those who have our personal data, that they don't abuse our personal data, they don't misuse our personal data, and they keep on keeping our personal data very well. So the first right is the right to be informed. Whatever you collect on my behalf, I have the right to be informed. Because if I come to your website and I do anything there and you collect my information, you must inform me. Or I paper-wise, hard copy, I send you some information and you have collected my personal data, you have the right, to, I have the right to be informed. So the right to be informed is that at any given time, I can come to your organization and say what you have concerning me. 
The second one is right of access. I have, I have must have access to everything concerning me. Every person that I have gotten concerning me, I have the access to view them. Their right to ratification. Even though I've given you the personal data, if there's anything I feel I need to change, I need, I can rectify it. Then you have right to erase it. This all means that even though I have given you my personal data, I can decide to say, okay, I don't want it within your domain again. I want you to delete all my personal data. I want you to erase all my personal data from Nasima. But for everything, there, can, there will also be an exception. If I am only Nasima and you ask me to delete, you have you because you have an obligation to fulfill, I will not delete. So it is not automatic, except you have no obligation with Nasima. And then if you are said that things that borders on security, I may not delete. By virtue, we'll get there with time. You see it when we discuss the next slide. Then the right to restrict processing. I have every right to tell you not to use my data for anything again. I've told you what processing is all about, when you create, when you use, when you share, when you process, and then when you dispose. So I can decide to say, well, don't share my data. That's the right of processing. Or don't use my data to do anything within your organization or with anybody. So right of processing. Because the data is my own personal world. You are only a custodian. Every data control organization is a custodian. They are not the owner of the data. And the individual that is the data owner is the owner of his or her data. Right to data portability. You can remember there was a time that TNCC said you can switch from one service provider from Airtel to MTN, but we still retain the same number. That is portability. So if I have given you my personal data, I have the right to say, look, all the data I have given you, Nasima, send them to Institute of Directors or send them to an association like you. It is my data and you must follow my instruction. You have no right to query me that you cannot send it. And it must be sent in a plain, legible format that can be readable. Then the right to object. I have the right to object to any processing you are using my data to. If I discover that you are using my personal data illegally or illegitimately, or using it to do profile me, profile my activity, if I come on your website and you are not using my data because you can, I, you have my footprints, and you now use it to do automated decision making. Because you can do automated decision making when you see me and you are profile me, you can start selling me unnecessary address. Those of you who have been experiencing that, that is, you have the right to object to any company that stop using my, because already, because of what they have known about you, that's why they are sending you those address, because already they are profile you and they are now using it you are now using the automated decision to do those things. And that's why you will know that when a woman, you know what exactly her preference or a man is so preference because of the way he has been visiting your website. Also the right to automated decision making, which I have spoken about and profiling. Nobody has the right to profile you when you visit their website or make any automated decision making. Even in organization, they have no right to profile you through your personal data, whether it is electronic or non-electronic. Now, we've got into a legal basis for holding data. What are the reasons why you should hold my data? We have six reasons. Number one, content of subject. That is my consent. When I say consent, well-informed consent. I have given you a well-informed consent, not just any consent. That is that, the consent of the data subject. I have given you it in a written form that you can use my data to do certain things, or by virtue of your design form, and I have signed it, I said, okay, you can use it. That is my consent. Then there is a contract between us. For example, there's a contract between an employer and an employee. 
because you are engaged in that company, you have already signed a contract. So by virtue of the contract, they can hold your data and process your data. Then legal compliance, when they follow the law. By virtue of that is legal compliance, they have the right. There was one thing we call vital interest of data subject. The interest which I have explained before, the vital interest is that as a data subject, purely in a medical environment, you are sick, you are down, and they need your blood group, they need everything. So by virtue that the doctor can use your personal data to make treatment. Or even in an organization, you are incommunicado, and they need to get certain things from you, but you, have no, you cannot talk at that time. You have not given them your express consent. And because they know that if they don't use that personal data for you, maybe you are sick and they, 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 they don't say, from your records in, our, in your organization, PHR, can you give us the broad group of this fellow? You at that particular time, you cannot talk, cannot do anything. It is in your own vital interest that the HR is releasing it. So the HR cannot be penalized for it. Then public interest. When there is a security in anything that will affect the security of any nation, public interest, or anything that will affect this, anything that will affect the public, they, your personal data can also be used. Then we have the legitimate interest. I've told you, by virtue, as a Nasima, you have a legitimate, you are covered up by certain things which is legitimate in nature. So by that, you can also use the personal data of your members, of your, of your employees, where the needs arise. Now, let's go to the next slide. This is very, very important. For every data controller, you have to do data audit. If you don't do data audit, according to Article 417, of the Nigeria Data Protection Regulation, you are breaching. So, as with Nasima now, already you are in breach because you are supposed to have done a data audit for Nasima by now. And you are supposed to have finished that data audit and filed with a NIDA. It is not compulsory that all ministry, departments, and agencies of the government must do data audit and must file with NIDA. If they don't, they will be penalized. And they are given until July ending. But for people like Nasima, because of, it was supposed to be, that audit was supposed to be October 38th, 2019, but by, by they extended it to March 15th. But when we had coronavirus, they have extended it to June 38th. And June 30th has passed. So, Neither has the right to penalize you for not doing your data audit by now. So already you are guilty. So what you need to do is to look for a DPCO like us, because we are a, a licensed agent. We can do the data audit. But one thing I want you to know is that data audit to neither does not make you not to pay breach in future. We always advise people to do data privacy impact assessment because every organization has gaps. And those gaps, you have to cover them. And the only way you can cover those gaps is by introducing policies, designing of new forms, putting mechanical security in place so that your staff, employee, or outsider will not be able to act and we follow those policies. I want you to know that the greatest hacker is now you have them inside the organization. Inside hackers are worse than external hackers in the sense that they know more about the organization than the external hackers. And when you see an external hacker hacking into your system, it is a true decognizer of some staff within your organization but whereby you have data protection policies in place. It will help you a lot to reduce the incidence 
It may not eliminate in totality, but it will reduce. So my advice for Nasima is to quickly start a data audit so that you can protect your organization instead of paying. My next slide will say, tell you that, but let's concentrate on this data audit. For anybody having 10,000 data subjects below, your annual filing return is just 5,000 Naira. Between 10,000 and 50,000 data subjects, when I say data subjects, I mean individual. That is, it is not affecting your employees alone. Your vendors, you keep their information. Your members, national members, you keep their information. Your employees summarize, aggregates together. If they are less than 10,000, you only pay 5,000. But if they are between 10,000 and 50,000, you pay 10,000. And if they are more than 50,000, you pay 20,000 Naira as annual data fee. Now, I want you to look at the sanctions for non-compliance. If you don't comply, like you have not complied now, because you have not done your data audits, you are going to pay the minimum fine is 1% of your annual gross revenue. So you know your annual gross revenue of the preceding year, which means if you commit an offense this year, your annual gross revenue of 2019, 1% will be charged on it, or you pay 2 million, whichever is higher. If your 1% is 2.1 million, that is what you will be charged upon. But if your 1% is 1 million, 900,000, you will have to pay 2 million. So whichever is greater. But the maximum you can pay under NDPR is 2% of your annual gross. And this is, these are tied to data subjects. So if your data subject is less than 10,000, you that's where you pay 1%. But where your data subject is above 10,000, you pay 2% of your annual gross revenue or 10 million, whichever is higher of the preceding year. Our own law is very, very lenient compared to EUDPR. And that's why I brought EUDPR by side because you are being binded by EUDPR as well so that you can know the effect on your cash flow. If you pay 50 million to neither today Nasima, it's going to affect your cash flow. And cash flow is the live wire of any organization. And it's going to affect your image, your integrity. Because the people, because NIDA will not just collect, press will take it and say, Nasima has breach, NIDA. First page, front page, and you see people calling you. Members will be calling you here and there. What has happened? What has happened? Your DG will be running here and there to save the integrity of Nasima. So my advice is that you do it as quickly as possible. Then EUDPR look at their sanction. As of today, EUDPR has fined so many organizations. Like British Airways was fined 50 million euro. Like Google was fined, some have been fined 500 million. So you can imagine if you are not very good. Some banks have been fine, but they would not tell you because they don't want you to panic. So they did not make it open. Because if you know, that is not in a year in Europe, if they know, some people will go to the bank and remove their phone. So they kept it silent. So Euro, if you breach in Euro, that's the EU DPR, you are going to pay 10 million Euro or 2% of the total worldwide annual turnover of the preceding year, whichever is higher. Even if it's only 10 million euro, convert 10 million euro into Naira. Because if you want to pay, you are not going to pay in Naira. You are going to buy euro worth 10 million Naira. What will be the effect on your cash flow? What will be the effect on your member? Then the maximum you will pay is 20 million or 4% of total worldwide. You can now see 4% of your total world. It is not limited to Nigeria. If you have members, outside Naya Nasima. Worldwide, you are paying 4% of your or 20 million euro. Let's assume your 4% is nothing. You will still have to cough 20 million. So my advice is that you make sure 
you don't allow yourself to breach either of the laws. Now, because they know some people can just report, so they have put some things on ground, breach reporting system. So when somebody reports that you are breached, they have to prove. But one thing is that if you yourself you are breached in the real sense of it, what you need to do is that you need to contact NIDA immediately within 72 hours that you are breached. Then you need to notify all those that are involved, everybody whose personal data has been stolen or has been assessed legally, you need to notify them. And you need to publish in the paper that you have breached. If you don't do all this, you are getting more problem to yourself. But one thing I want you, even if it has happened in Nigeria, there is a case in Nigeria that happened this year between Lagos Internal Revenue Service, LRS, and the consultant, data processor. LRS gave their consultant a job to do for them, to do computation, task computation. Instead of the consultant to report back to LRS, he went ahead and published the computational tax of the people. And there's no way he's going to publish that will not show some personal details about those individuals. You are exposing so people saw it and they informed NIDA. And LRS was called up. But fortunately for LRS, they did what was supposed to do. They shut down the site immediately. They, they went to NIDA to report themselves that we are breached. And they made publication. And they even called me. And because they attended our training in July, because we were the first to organize training on NDPR, and NIDA was there. They came to that training to as a supervisory agency. Nigeria Computer Society was also there to look at what we were doing. And they, at that training, LRS sent two employees for that training. So they use it as well that look, we didn't do it intentionally. It was not even LRS, it was our consultant. And because we want to follow float with NDPR, that was why we have sent two of our people to for this training. So what we are doing today by listening to this is part of the awareness we are creating for need for you on behalf of NIDA. So you can also use this, the knowledge of today for a lot of things. Now I want to talk about administrative redress planning. For any time that you have breach, you have the right to, for redress. You can write to them, no, that it does not happen like that. And they will look at your, to your, what you have asked them that no, you didn't do it intentionally. And they will look at it within seven days. They will ask you to come and they will respond to your allegations. It will, it, they will not take more than seven days so that because you can have a backlog. If they don't do it immediately, that will be a problem. Then we have duration of data record storage. I have told you at the beginning that we have statutory retention period and we also have organizational data records story. Neither has not told you anything concerning story. You have that for yourself. You must enter into contract with those parties that are concerned. The, the number of years or months you want to store their data for, how you will delete their data, how they can always, the cost implication of storage and all those things to be determined by your, by your organization. Neither has nothing to do with that. Now we come to transfer of data abroad. You cannot just transfer data abroad if it is not in the list of NIDA. We have countries, NIDA has countries that you can transfer data to because they have this regulation. Every EU organization country you can transfer because they have data protection regulation in place. And also all those companies that have data protection regulation in place and you can transfer data. But those who don't have, and it's not in the list of NIDA, you cannot transfer data to those countries. All you need to do, you have to go to Minister of Justice and seek the permission of Attorney General of the Federation 
before you can transfer data to such country. Now I want to look at, let me tell you the roadmap to implementation. For you, because you have not started, you want to start now, the roadmap is this. You must have a plan. When you have the plan, you have to obtain the buy-in of the stakeholders. Because if you don't have this buy-in of the ESCO, I mean your executive people there, it can never work. Then you have to put a team on ground. Then you identify relevant processes and third parties activities. You compile a data inventory because you have data already. You must have a data inventory of what you have. You have to clean the house, which means there are a lot of things you have collected, personal data, which you don't need. You must now clean the house. So that is what we call data minimization. Then you create a privacy policy. Every organization must have a privacy policy. We also refer to this as privacy by notice. Every organization that has a website, your privacy policy must be on your website. And also at your request reception. The one on your website will be so elaborate and telling people a lot. But at the reception, one page is enough. You may do it in form of a plaque while you collect data, what you use it for, how you rectify, and data subject right, you can just put it in just one way, one page, so that anybody who comes to your organization, they see it there, it shows that you are doing the right thing. Now, what can you do? You must have processes in place, you must have policies in place, and procedure documentation. Then you review consent data subjects are giving you. You have to process access requests. You must validate data transfer as well, and you must report data breaches. So everybody must be involved as a watchdog so that your organization will not at all pay fine. Now, C, you have to improve. You have to train your staff and then you look whether there is any project on ground. Project, you, so if there is any new project you want to do, you have to do carry out a project impact assessment. So that how will it affect the business? How will it affect the employees? How will it affect your, your vendors? Then you carry out the audits. After the data audit, because NIDA has a framework data audit which we use. It's just a five page data audit. You fill it, you answer the questions, we'll see the gaps, we we'll advise you and bring out recommendations for you what to do so that you can close your gaps. And then we'll now give, send your report to NIDA, we file it. Now, I want to test your knowledge with this. Read what is on my screen. My screen is asking Nasima that, which departments hold most of the data, personal data in your organization? Which department? There may be one, there may be two, but which, what are those departments that hold most of the personal data in your organization? You have to, you can, send it through chat or when we finish, if you want to, you can raise up your hand and give us the answer. Who are the key players when it comes to Nigeria data protection regulation? The key players are those of us seated today listening to this webinar. Like me, I'm a data subject because I'm an individual whose data is to be protected. Data controller, an entity who determines the purposes for and the manner in which personal data is processed. Then you have the data processor, one who processes data on behalf of the data controller. The DPO is an in-house officer. There is a law now by NIDA, federal government, that every ministry, department, and agency more has an in-house data protection officer. But for corporate organization, you can always, you must have as well but you can use any staff within your organization and train him to be your data protection officer. And when he's a data protection officer, it has become an intern, he has become, he or she has become an internal consultant because it's going to see a lot of, to a lot of things so that you will not breach and policies and controls are in place and they are adhered to. Then we have the data protection compliance organization. The DPC are people like me like our organization, data and wide information management services, we are one of the licensed DPCOs, and we are supposed to carry out 
services on behalf of NIDA. Then we have the NIDA, National Information Technology Development Agency. They are the independent regulator in Nigeria. They are the, our information commissioner officer in Nigeria. So they have all the powers and they can do and undo. But they must follow their regulations. So we have the NDPR compliance methodology, which we use in our organization, which you don't need, which I don't need to bore you with now. But let's go to reflections. Nasima, I am directing to you. If you are audited by the DPCO today, could you provide a complete record of a specific individual data, e.g., that is, for example, my own personal data that's with you now. Can you provide me if I say I want to see my personal data? Can you provide me with my personal data? Can you tell me why you have it? What purpose is being held for? What concerns you have in the process? If a customer or a staff asks for all their data to be delivered to them, can you deliver their data to them? Or if you ask you to transfer their data to NECA, can you transfer that data to NECA? Are those data available immediately? Have you obtained explicit, informed, and ambiguous concern from everyone on your mailing list? All your members, you have well-informed concern from them that you can use their personal data, Nasima. Have you had your data protection policies and procedures review since the start of April 25, when this law came into effect? Have you done it? Do you, which I know you have not done. Do you have procedures in place to report breaches of data principles? You have not as well. This is a reflection. Now, conclusion. Executive buy-in and involvement is key to the success of NDPR. Without executive buy-in, without the DG championing this, there is nothing you can do. Because the DG will liaise with members and tell them what they want to do because you have committees. And the committees must know about it and the committee must also, including your president, everybody must be carried along. The president must be aware. Like the instructor of directors, the day I was there, the president organized of instructor of directors organized for their members this particular NDPR awareness. It was there, and all the ESCO members were there. They made it a, a day affair, evening affair. It, we started around six and we finished around eight. The all some members were there, the, all the escorts were there, everybody, because they want to know what is going on. Because the president is championing, and that's why they are starting their compliance procedure any moment from now with us. The organization should be well informed and educated, not just be compliant, but also take advantage of NDPR for return on investment. When you follow the policy, the rules, and regulation, it's going to enhance the image of. Nasima, and there will be returns on your investment because the risk will be reduced, crimes will be reduced. And when those things are reduced, then by virtue of a MPR policy, controls you are put in place, you have returns on investment. Physically, you may not see it, but indirectly, it's going to affect your returns. Also, it will facilitate and enable compliance for other data protection regulations. So, like EU GPR is a regulation, because you are doing NDPR, at least it's going to affect EU GPR compliance as well. So, you will know what to do and you will not breach EU GPR. Common citizens are being guaranteed of their freedoms and rights, unlike other laws that protect governments, politicians, and the corporate interests. Right now, this law is protecting every one of us, those of us individuals and data subject because we own our data and we can do anything with our data, unlike other laws whereby they can just use our data to do anything. Adequate enforcement and measures to be in place for effective compliance and stakeholder. Nasima, whether you like it or not, you must put adequate enforcement. When you make regulations and you don't enforce, is zero. And that is what is destroying Nigeria today. We don't need any single law again in Nigeria. We have, more, we have a lot of laws, but because there's no monitoring agency, and when it's being monitored, there's no enforcement. 
And that is why we are in this situation we are today. So the same thing is applicable to organizations. When you put laws, regulations in place, and you don't enforce either by penalty, either through if an employee commits any error now, you don't penalize you either by suspension or by expulsion to, to, to make to be a deterrent to others, then you have not done anything. It is not just putting regulation in place that matter, but enforcing that regulation so that you will know that other, the people will not do what they are not supposed to do. And finally, I want you to know one thing today, that when talking about privacy or protection, it's all about trust. If I give you my personal data, it's because I trust you, either as an organization or as an individual. So you have the right to safeguard my data and you must respect my privacy. If you don't respect my privacy, there's no way you want to safeguard my data because I have given you on trust. Another thing is that whatever you collect, protect it. If you know you cannot protect, don't collect. Be aware. When you go on the internet, be aware where you connect. Connect with care. If you just connect to anywhere, you may be doing yourself a great danger. Most organizations are guilty of this last one I want to tell you. Hardly will you go to any organization, from my experience, that every, almost 99.9% .9 of employees are guilty. Even in our homes, we are guilty, which is leave a clear dex while you are away at the end of each day. You don't file files on your table. Demand for filing cabinets. You don't open your screen, your, your laptop for people to read what is on your laptop. When you are not using the information, shut that file down so that people passing will not see it. Today, we all carry mobile phones. I don't need to carry a file out of your organization before I get personal data. All I need to do is just take my phone, take a picture of the data I need. Simple. By the time I'm going out of the security, security, your security area, your reception, they won't challenge me because I'm not carrying any file. But I have already taken picture of certain documents which I need. So he doesn't know. And even if you put somebody in place to check my phone, I can take the picture and transfer it to anywhere immediately and delete it from my phone. So the world is becoming, we are using data, data, the data is the new oil, is the new currency. And that is why we, nothing like oil again. Our oil now is data because we are in a big data situation now. Everybody is using data now. The data we use now is money. You people are ready to buy data at any cost because they will benefit from it. In your home, you don't put file, you don't put information in your city room anyhow. People can come here and see certain documents, they can use it against you. And I also want to warn you, you all work in an organization, but let me tell you, some people are working for three masters. Some are working for Nasima, some are working for politicians outside your organization, some are also working for your competitors. So, Every paper you are supposed to shred, you don't shred. And you squeeze and you put in a dustbin. At the end of the day, the cleaner will come. All those papers that, are not, that you think they are useless, they are not useful to you, it is useful for the cleaner. The cleaner will take the paper one by one and stretch it. And with his or her mobile phone, take picture of those documents and send those documents to the fellow. The day he sends those documents to other employers, when I say under employer, apart from Nasima, it's not the day that employer will use that document. It may take three, four, five years. You will be shocked the day they will use it against you. So we are in a data wall. Keep document. And if you don't keep document, you are digging your grave. Unfortunately, it's not going to affect you alone. It's going to affect your family, your, your husband or your wife, your children, and your unborn child is going to affect them and may debar them from getting to places in fulfilling destiny. And that's why I always tell people that privacy is a function of fulfilling destiny. For every individual privacy, it goes into national privacy. For each individual keeping their privacy, 
and you have a culture of privacy that then everybody will do something good by keeping the national privacy. But where we don't have individual privacy, we don't take it serious, there's no way we can have national privacy because individually we come as an agreement to have a national privacy. Thank you. That is the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Uh, DJ, I don't know if you would like to make some comments. Huh? Uh, DJ Ambassador, you're allowed to come. Yes, okay. Let me make some comments. Okay. Are you you, have, the floor, you mm -hmm. have the floor. Okay, no video. But can you can you hear me? I'm hearing you very well, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Um, honestly, I want to say thank you uh, to you for this. Um, this has been very, very, very informative and very, very educative to all of us. Um, and let me say that um, um, this is just the beginning as far as data itself is concerned. Um, the whole question of data is heavy. And we talk about big data, we talk about digitalization era. Um, big data, big business, uh, you've shown us that in this, uh, you know, the figures after six is more than seven. If I can use the Yoruba. Uh, yes, you are permitted, sir. Uh, that proverb. Yeah. And you've shown us that this is just the beginning of it. I want to say this is not the beginning of it because I was discussing with my account section that are we in the net as far as the data uh, requirements is concerned? Should not, well, they were saying that, no, they're not sure. We're not part of it. We don't have to, in context of audit, we don't have to file returns in terms of uh, use of data. I want to clarify that later. Maybe we can talk about that later if mm -hmm. Nasima is required or not. But the point I'm making is that um, okay. what we've done to us today is an eye-opener. And I'm sure very, very many of those people who have locked in have learned one or two lessons. And I will say that don't let us make this just one off. Um, maybe for that. Perhaps you need in terms of how to take it on. And so we make it a dialogue. Um, last year I was at in, in Ghana for the GAPS. The GAPS stands for German African Business Summit. And what they are saying is that um, um, you know, they're now looking at Africa and looking at when you talk of Africa anyway, I mean, when you take Nigeria out of it, perhaps South Africa, what is left, that um, they want to look at data, big data as business. They want to look at Africa, the, no longer the question of the age of 0.7% uh, uh, ODA. That we want to, they want to see us Africa. They want to see Nigeria as a business partner. And when you're talking about the business partner, partner special area comes in. Um, so with our elbows. And uh, in, in accordance with the new normal, and then and work out that area, um, which of course is a big thing. I mean, people are saying now that the phone companies are not even making money from telephone calls; they're making big money from data. Yes. So once again, I say thank you very much. Uh, we need more educations like this, and I'm sure many of our members who have joined will be glad and very happy because a large number of them are also. To moving on to digital ecosystem, e-commerce, and they will need more guidance and information in respect and from, from experts like you. Once again, thank you very much. And I want to seize the opportunity. I saw that many of our members and participants uh, joined as well. Um, we will let them know when next we're going to have the next one and what areas we're going to focus on. Um, thank you very much. And, I, and please let us all continue to stay uh, safe and you know, keep to the protocols and guidelines um, so that uh, we'll be able to, at least at the end of the day, as the economy gradually opens, we can also participate if, if, if So, DG, in it. I want to uh, respond again, to- Thank you very much, and I 
thank all those who have joined. Yes, sir. Please, let, let me respond to your question, whether you are involved or not. Nasima, yes, I'm listening. Go on, sir. Nasima is a data controller. Data, okay. You, any organization that collects personal data of an individual yes. is a data controller. And the Thank government, you we are in Abuja, November 28, 29, on e-government conference. I was there. The okay. Yeah. And the president said that whoever does not comply, he even point on ministry departments and agency MDAs because he, he knows that they are the biggest culprit. Say he can remove a minister because of it. <laughs> okay. So Nasima is a data controller. You are being binded by this regulation. Not only NDPR, if you keep any resident, EU resident data. EU GDPR is also binding on you. Okay. They don't need to, they have a, people like us can work for, we have been licensed to work for EU, EU GDPR and also NDPR. So they don't need to look for anybody in Nigeria. All they need is to just send us. I have clients who send us mails that they have clients in Nigeria doing business in Nigeria from UK that they want us to do their, be their DPCO and work for them. And yesterday I was with Minister of Health. I was the I am the consultant of Minister of Health. The commissioner you see everywhere now, Professor Akia Bayobi, had to call me to come and he has been asking a lot of questions. I made presentation for them yesterday. They wanted to buy some software, and they invited me to come and see those soft, see those software whether they are relevant or not. So the vendors they came. One of the major conditions they gave them that if you are not NDPR compliant, they will not do business with you. Not only you as a vendor, even those because the kind of software they, they want to sell range is going to millions of naira. Uh, even those who are your partners, they must be compliant because they don't want to fall into because LRS has opened the eyes of so many people. So they don't want to be in problem. So so that is it. So you are you, you all your vendors in time must be NDPR compliant. Not only you, Nasima. Thank, th thank you very much, um, Okay. Th thank you. Well, thank you very much. And now you now see the reason why. I why I said this. Um, you know, small little. project. Thank you again, and um, I wish you a very good weekend, each and every one of us. And um, please stand by, you know, for the next one in the series. We will talk to you too as well directly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming on board. Thank you for encouraging uh, us. Thank you for making Nigeria to be a competitive nation. Nasima is the biggest organization, and you have a, a, a long time history. So if nationals can, you can imagine the number of members and companies you are going to influence if you are, all, if you are also in compliance. Thank you very much once again. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. We've come to the end of today's webinar. Thank all the participants for attending. Uh, and we would update you with regards to future webinars to come. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>